ended on. I mean, I, I've seen this is one of the big kind of drawbacks, I think, with the way um, cultural people could engage with space agencies, because I wonder if, and maybe Bernard can comment on that, if there's any natural room for criticality in the work of space agencies. Um, because it, it, you know, the, what, what, uh, in order to plan and carry out missions, you've got to really believe in them. And I think one of the problems is, is actually how could space agencies actually incorporate any criticism or criticality of this kind uh, because it's so difficult to go into space. I'm going to hand um, the microphone. If you have a question, will you just indicate I'm going to start? Well, the space business is really built on the principle of a republic <laughs> in the sense that we have to listen to the customers, we have to serve the students, but we have also to understand uh, okay, the practice, the good practice. Uh, so, no, it's engineering. Uh, uh, I'm a lawyer, but a lawyer of physics and engineering. These are the laws I think that you cannot escape. And uh, so, when you build a spacecraft, you have to really respect uh, some, uh, some of, the, of this. Now, um, the customers, but also looking, uh, uh, having, uh, having a strategy, and I think also a vision that is uh, shared. And in this, we have to, to listen to everybody, the public, but also everybody individually. I think that it's, it's important. Um, and um, also, what, uh, in order to make progress, it's very important to have sometimes independent views. Because if uh, everybody goes in the same direction, then start to be uh, a bit uh, worry. Because uh, inventive uh, ideas or also um, uh, criticism helps you to go further. Any other questions? I guess I'm interested in, you touched on the fact that the mirror doesn't have any ownership or any legal aspects, and I wondered if there were any moves in a direction, and is it an opportunity for a sort of gene rock and very magical future of humanity coming together? I, I really hope so. Um, I think uh, actually just last week here at Republic of the Moon, there, there was a bit of a debate around this that the um, We Colonize the Moon guys, I think Kent Hagen and Sue are in, are in the room, looked at the International Space Treaty, which is supposed to kind of set out these things. And I think um, it's true that it's, it's kind of creaking at the seams. It's, it doesn't really cover every eventuality. I, I believe it only covers governments. It doesn't cover private um, companies or individuals, and uh, as we've seen, people, those kind of organisations are already starting to look at the moon. Um, so it's all a bit of a, a bit of a fuzzy area, and I think it's one of those things where um, the, the science is advancing and the technology is advancing, and it's only when when it arrives suddenly politicians and the media wake up and go, oh my god, this is a, why haven't we had a discussion about this? We could have had a discussion ten years ago, twenty years ago. Interestingly for me, it seems to be science fiction which is the area where these things are debated. When cloning came along with Dolly the Sheep, again, this huge media for, you know, how are we going to deal with this technology? This is shocking, the potential. There were science fiction novels dealing with those issues 20, 30 years before Dolly the Sheep, and it's only people who read sci-fi that were thinking about it. So I think maybe, you know, let's look to science fiction to get some ideas for this. I don't know if anyone else has any, any thoughts. Well, for me, on the... On the moon, the moon is very clear. There is an outer space treaty. It's endorsed by all countries, and I believe it's still very valid. And it applies to government and everybody that is in a country is a government, so it applies to all of us. The question, who on the moon? I think it's a, like a, a Western type of question. I believe in, we don't own the moon. We borrow, eventually. What's important is what we do on the moon. The moon is the eighth continent. We go there, we do things, not to own it, to do things, and we borrow the land, and uh, we have to give it back to our descendants in a good shape. Uh, we have to, be, to develop, uh, it's, uh, it's a place where we can settle, so we can extend our civilization to a, 
uh, two planet civilization with these three planets after the two Mars. But the uh, question of ownership is, I think it's uh, not necessary at the moment. We, have, we just have to respect the out of space uh, treaty. And, but also imagine in rich it, having more concern for a sustainable, uh, um, a sustainable um, exploration of the moon and looking also at all benefits you can get uh, for, for the Earth and making it uh, also um, add, okay, um, as a step towards future exploration and so on. Okay. Um, so, I, I, right now at the moment there are already a lot of inequalities in the world and, and so that not every country can afford to have its own space mission. And if you see a perceived future where more and more countries are getting involved in, say, going to the moon, going to outer space, do you think that these differences will exacerbate or do you see some, some kind of mechanism that will enable everyone to take part in this? So I think um, we've, we've seen this sort of already in, in one aspect of space activities. So there are a number of um, countries who have very active space programs, very much like um, Joanna shed a light on the Indian space program, which is very much delivering its benefits for applications in, in daily societal life, uh, whether it's agriculture data, metrological data, etc. And there has been a, a long history of spacefaring nations that have the capability to launch satellites who have opened their services uh, in a rather cooperative manner uh, for commerce reasons as well to offer piggyback rights to other countries who don't have their own launch capability. So I hope we can sort of use that model going forward to even further destinations. Um, and that in turn sort of brings a very uh, live value <coughs> ecosystem to our activities that make meaningful contributions to more than just one country uh, back at Earth. So I think there, there is a model that has value in, in every sense of space travel and, and uh, space activities. I see. On the question also, is everybody in the world benefiting more? Actually, it's a great decade. We had a fleet with that, we had the Indian, one million people, the Chinese also, yeah. another billion, the European, okay, with 450 million. Uh, uh, so, more than half of the world has got a mission to the moon. And uh, when I, we had Smart One, okay, it was a small mission, it was great to see all these uh, children engaged. It, 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 was, uh, it was part of uh, what had been done in that time. Um, and um, also what we have uh, obtained in terms of science is shared all over the scientists of the world. We have to make more effort to share it also for schools, for instance, to integrate it into, they have to rewrite the textbooks huh, anyway. Um, so every, every year so they will have to write uh, new textbooks because the uh, lunar exploration is moving faster. Clearly, this has to, we need to pervade into the daily life of, of the children and they must uh, feel that, uh, that uh, yeah, the human race is exploring uh, the moon. Now, you have, they have to go to the next step. They have been, at, they have been uh, looking at it, their parents have gone to the moon, but now how can the next generation can be an actor and then uh, participate to the next step? We have to see. Um, yeah. oh, okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I have worked with children yes, as well. So I, I need to say, I, I don't, see that work as supporting as necessarily supporting the space space further space technology. And I think that in how do you express indifference and how do you express um, dissatisfaction? I'm not sure how it's possible to do that. And in the absence of that, then where is the consensus? I think that's a, a, there's a central problem there. There are, there are quite a few very central problems to the way that um, progress in space is, is talked about that, that need to be more looked at, or well, the idea of humanity is, is one, and the idea of everybody, which are really the, which are concepts that are beyond experience, that none of us really know what humanity is or what everybody is to, to begin with. So 
there's a problem in justifications. There's a, I mean, who, who in India knew, knew about the, the Chandrayaan? When I ask a room full of people, there's kind of a, we all have these very partial views of, what's, of the world, of what's going on, and everybody would have a little bit of an idea, perhaps, not everybody would have an idea of Chandrayaan, it would have maybe, some people would know some things and some people know others. There's a Bruegel painting, is it by Bruegel, where Icarus falls in the ocean in the background, and the guys plowing the fields in the foreground, and it's like the fall of Icarus is just this drop in the ocean, not a very significant event. And Jan is like, it's like this, like it's very hard to actually say, I mean, I think that's a difficulty for you in how you think about what, what, to, what to do with the moon and who, who a public is and how a consensus can be arrived at, because it's such a difficult question, it's such a... Is that difficult? I, Yes, I, I see it. Better, so, better on great chance. <laughs> every kid <coughs> sees the moon. So you, in your past, you discover the moon by yourself. When you're young, you go in the countryside, you, you, you look at it, uh, you take the time. That's also something that it's an individual past. But, and the truth of some mind, the moon vehicle, it's complicated. It requires a, a rocket, it requires a spacecraft, and, and uh, that's why we, we have to teach that to the kid because it's part of the world of today, telecom, satellite. It's, uh, you know, they are so smart. This, they understand the internet much better than I do. So they can understand the rocket as well. I think. Yeah. Um, I, I do take Joanna's point about the fact that there is a, a sort of multiplicity of, of voices and, you know, like seven, seven billion of them and, and different opinions. Not everybody is going to care as much as I do about the exploration of space and uh, but, but I kind of like to draw it back to sort of a very personal point of view. I think of myself as a, as a kid being inspired by the amazing exploration that was being done in the 60s and 70s, the, the moon missions, um, the, the Viking landers on Mars, and that spoke to me in a very personal way and started me out on my journey to become you know, an astronomer. And I think about kids, geeky kids like me, who perhaps don't live in rich countries, you know, in a village in Africa or somewhere in Asia. The internet and the spread of media now means that those kind of pieces of information are getting out to much, much wider audiences. And I think about kids like me in those kind of remote places who might get that inspiration now from what's happening today. Not everybody, and it won't mean the same thing to everybody, but there will be some who 30 years ago would never have had those opportunities and now they might do. And okay, it might be difficult for them to pursue a career, but it might set them on that path and that means a lot to me, actually. Um, so I, I just go back a few years, so, um, since I was 17, uh, Jill mentioned I've been working with the Space Generation Advisory Council and it's a non-profit organisation for um, young people, by young people, we all form committees, we write papers, we go and actually uh, collaborate uh, and have our own conference when the International Professional Conference meets about space activities. We have a seat at the UN where we educate um, decision makers about the different collective views of all young people around the world. And through all the different projects that I've been involved with, whether to do with astronomy, the moon, building a vision for the next 50 years by young people for what we want to tell the leaders of today. All of those activities have actually told me that the night sky and the moon and, and all uh, everything that we see as ourselves in space is actually a very great equalizer for everyone, someone growing in Africa. Um, we've had people talk about um, their uh, Growing up, knowing the night sky in a context, not only how the Philippine, uh, uh, you know, a, a tribe in Philippines will know it, but now being able to apply it to policy uh, recommendations for the world. So I think, as Bernard says, everybody goes and you know everybody knows the moon. Everybody's had their own philosophical journey with the moon. And as Mark said, we now live in a time in humanity where these dialogues can happen, and we are doing a huge amount of discovery through this sort of connection, I think um, there, there are several platforms now on which we can actually you know, learn about uh, what scientific achievements are and how we express them as humanity from different parts of the world, different perspectives, different languages. And that's, I think, you know, 
it's actually a real equalizer as much as there are quite a lot of inequalities that exist in, in the ways of understanding what we are doing in space. I know there's another question. I'm sorry, I'm fine. Okay. I'm going to abuse my position as chair. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm bursting. I have to play devil's advocate. Um, are we not overlooking geopolitics here? No, I mean, on the contrary, I see that the equalizer, I see that I'm, not so, I'm not looking for it because really uh, you have to express the diverse, the diversity okay. of, uh, of, of space. You have different countries. Have, um, but it's true, I mean, we have the same moon, we have the same uh, sky. And it's great to find the, the diversity of, of approach. Uh, what I found also, okay, we have now this virtual world that just invades us all. <laughs> and I hope that uh, artists and scientists, engineers, we are also going to keep the other part of ourselves, which are the hands on part. Part of us where we can develop projects that we own, <laughs> that, uh, that we can uh, develop uh, with, uh, with uh, our partners. Um, in the same way that actually, I didn't go into expression because of Apollo. I went to expression because I went in the field when I was young. We had a great party sleeping over at night, <laughs> and we were looking at, uh, at stars. And it was hands on. And I think that's, that's something also we want to communicate um, uh, to the kids. They, they can lead themselves their ways. Uh, they, they understand their relation to the universe by themselves. And uh, space exploration is just one way one ingredient, but uh, the main way is what you do yourself for your life, and how you, how you feel the connection with the planet, with the universe. Your I mean, it's certainly a legitimate discourse, but I'm just wondering about the, the discourse that runs alongside of this, which is about countries demonstrating their economic, technological capabilities and ultimately their, their military capabilities. I mean, how, particularly historically, but is that yes. still as important? <coughs> I mean, for instance, uh, uh, clearly, uh, space uh, came out of okay, military uh, development. Uh, uh, we had missiles, and I remember, uh, for instance, uh, space science or agency started with, we were given missiles, and we were told, okay, can you put instruments on board? And then that's how we made some of the first uh, discoveries. So there was a dual uh, development. Um, now, okay, we uh, have developed telecommunications or the whole commercial world which benefits from what has been invested uh, early. Um, and the different countries okay, generate uh, growth, uh, economic benefit, uh, but uh, still there is uh, okay, a military uh, aspect. Um, as you see for instance, China, uh, it was a strong demonstration of what a country can do with all this uh, infrastructure system uh, launching a rocket. It has also very a benefit to unify people, which uh, are speaking very different languages. Or in, in India, I think even more, um, they can feel proud to be on a country that uh, send a, a, probe, a probe to the moon. And um, it has clearly some strong political uh, Sorry. Great. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. Great. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm Harlan from Recolonize the Moon, and I think I have a very geeky question I would be very interested in, and I'd take this moment to have the experts here. So I, have, I think it's a very interesting time, and I have no doubts that we will go back to the moon, and we have a lunar base, and the moon probably is like a jumping pad for Mars. Maybe we have sample returns to the outer planets, maybe we have sample returns to Titan and so on. But what is the future of the future? What is after the solar system? Where is space flight going? Is this the end? It's like even if you would make it to Pluto and set up a base on Pluto one day, what's next? What is the future of the future? Thank you. Just, just a small question. I, I love questions like that because I, I, I can genuinely say I, I don't have uh, a final answer. I think you've got to think about what, why we why would we go to these places. Um, there are always, you know, practical reasons that you know, people will, will profit and benefit by it in some way. And then there's also the, the reason of just sheer exploration. We've already seen with this Mars One um, idea. There are really people signing up to go on a one-way trip to Mars, which I certainly would never want to do, but some people would clearly do it. Um, as to where we go beyond the solar system, I think there's as well as the, the future of space propulsion and, and you know how we can travel these vast distances, on those kind of timescales, 
we don't really know what the rest of our technology will do to us as human beings. What are chips that can go onto a spacecraft? You know, what, that, that future of humanity, I think, is all rolled up into that story. Um, and again, I think it's science fiction where we really need to look to for some of the, um, the guidelines as to where the future might take us. So this is where I, I truly believe that um, the mission of the planetary society really kind of helps answer or at least visualize what sort of future we will live in. Uh, you know, the ultimate aim of why we're doing anything that looks outwards is one, to find our own place in space, and secondly, to understand whether are we alone. And those are two fundamental questions I think we can gravitate towards to sort of say, well, what are the different things that would allow us to learn? How, you know, how did we get here? Uh, what are the things that are the necessary conditions? And, and what does it take to really be an interplanetary species to what you were, were saying? Um, and I think we, you know, the, the future of the future is, is really in our hands, to be honest. We will, you know, we will be um, sort of choosing one path or another. It might be that we upload a lot of personalities uh, into um, uh, sort of an instrument which is just fairly robotic and actually goes in. And you know, one example is the Voyager spacecraft at the edge, well, outside our, our solar system and going into, into into galactic distances, um, trying to still find sort of what is out there, or at least as a beacon of our own civilization into sort of what is the vastness of, of nothingness at the moment for us. So I think, as much as I'm sort of saying that, you know, we don't know where it will end, because the best thing about the future is that we're creating it all the time with our actions. Can I, can I just, I've just been Googling. Um, the 100 Year Starship um, project is a joint US defense, DARPA defense advanced research project and NASA project. And funnily enough, they invited an artist because I know Marco Pelkin was invited to go and speak to them. And so, yes, the 100 Year Starship is my answer if you'd like. Do you know about that? Not yet. Uh, but it's a, it's a US military actually seems to be looking into the future in this case. Well, okay, thank you about um, 100 years uh, starship. We are doing it now, because actually the main, uh, the main step you have to jump is how, how do, are we going to be able to live autonomously out of us? And the best way to, to try it is to start with the lunar base nearby, put uh, a, a number of astronauts living autonomously, living off the land, if you don't want to see the Earth, it's easy. Just go a bit beyond the pole, far side. You never see the Earth. It's the only place in the solar system where you don't see the Earth. And then you will feel very isolated. So it's a very good way to prepare for the interstellar or spaceship. But there are many other things that we can do before in parallel. We have this question, are we alone in the universe? Uh, some of the answers is looking with telescopes at other planets around other stars looking on, uh, um, on Mars or also on Titan, if, or in Europa, or Ganymede, if um, there are habitable places in our solar system to understand better what habitability means. And um, then the other question is, can we bring Earth life elsewhere? So this will be the first test we have done in space station, but we need to do it on the moon and looking at other places where we could uh, safely and sustainably uh, okay, and uh, this is a, a part where we have a, a lot of things to do in our solar system, but in parallel, that's true, you, we can make studies uh, about uh, 100 years of the starship when we have found the right stars that to go. <laughs> but we are very close to, to having some good candidates that we would like to go. Can I, can I ask, you and Sue have been doing a lot of work here, and you're coming to the end of your, your time here. Can I turn it back on you? Yeah. Uh, Yes. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm honest, I don't know. <laughs> Fair enough. Sue, so what do you think? Um, well, gosh. Oh, sorry. I'm uh, <laughs> checking the Twitter feed for questions. Uh, is your mic uh, I'm, I'm checking to see if somebody's asking any questions on the Twitter feed. <laughs> Sue, the other half of we 
of the effects of space programs. Look at the work of Alice Gorman, who uh, talks about um, the people who lived next to launch sites in Australia and in Peru, where, where ESA launches its rockets. Start to see, that's, you can start to see where there are problematics in uh, what it is in, in space technologies and the imaginaries that fuel them, and the very grounded proximal effects that, that happen, that are part of the same picture and there needs to be a way of talking about them as part of the same picture. That's, that's part of the vocabulary that needs to be expanded around space technologies. 
to um, yeah to enrich future. No, I agree. We have to be responsible. It's a great question. Um, I think. In some way, we've all kind of alluded to how we got interested in space. For, for me, growing up in India, I was most fascinated because I wanted to, to um, do an experiment with a spider that would be carried into Skylab, which never happened, but it was, it, it was a way to try and understand gravity and how spiders would react in gravity. So I had the chance to write a book chapter on birds, bees, um, animals and fish in space, and I can tell you that there are several, in fact every mission has carried other species with uh, us, um, and there, there are experiments long term that have been looking at effects of um, space environment on different species in the International Space Station and several other kind of um, you know, space outposts we've had. So I'm very certain that in some respect we will be taking, you know, much more of, of the diverse gene pool from uh, Earth to wherever we go. We've got to also do it in a way that we're respectful, um, we comply to not polluting essentially <coughs> or putting uh, such species in almost um, very much um, situations which are harmful. So, you know, um, radiation is the, the biggest of uh, all risks to any. Um, living organism out in space or any uh, element of life and, and we've got to be kind of there, there is a trade-off and um, a little balance to be had uh, but i'm sure that, that it, it is not only humans that we're thinking of there are there is evidence that actually bacteria um, that was accidentally deposited on one of the um, uh, the the lunar rovers you know, still sort of lives on. <laughs> so, so we do have um, an ability to even inadvertently actually do this um, migration of species. Yes. Um, I'll try to be as concise as I can. I tend to waffle, but w will we take the biosphere with us when we go into space? I think the answer is yes, we will. It's not just uh, pretty surroundings for us here on Earth. It is our life support system, and it is the most efficient life support system there is, so we will go, we will take plants and animals with us, I'm sure of that. Are we in danger of playing God? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, science and technology give us increasing power and control over our environment. Uh, that's just a fact. We have to take responsibility for that, that power, and that's something that everybody needs to be involved in. Whether that will happen, I don't know, but that's that's just the way it is. But I think um, I think my final point would be there does tend to be a sort of a strand of criticism of the space program that it's sort of distracting attention away from problems here on Earth. You know, why are you you know frittering away your efforts out here? What I would say to that is again alluding back to those Apollo images of the Earth seen from the Moon, which kind of helped to kickstart the environmental movement. Everything that I have learned about the rest of the universe has helped me to understand the Earth better. Everything we've learned about the rest of the universe helps us to see how unique and special and precious the Earth is. And it also gives us a new understanding of how the Earth works and how to take care of it. So I don't think that the quest to understand the universe is a waste of time. I think there's always value in that, and the question is how do we weigh that value against all the other things that we need to do down here. I mean, just a moment, I'm going to ask um, for a final round of applause. Um, but before I do, just two things. Firstly, I've resisted giving any quotes, but if you're interested in this topic, do keep an eye out because there's going to be a special issue in space policy on this topic, and all of the presenters today are going to be contributing <laughs> Can't escape. It's going to happen. Um, secondly, just a reminder that um, tomorrow is the last day of the exhibit, so if you have friends who haven't been to see it yet, um, do you know remind them that we've got one day left. And there's also an event tomorrow night um, about the history of drinking in space. I'm not sure if there's any tickets left or not, but oh, there aren't. But there's a waiting list. So. Um, Finally, just to say one last time, thanks so much to everybody um, for the great conversation, to you as the audience, and can I ask for one final round of applause.